thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I wish, uh, as Matt said, that our topic were not so timely. A week ago, followers of ISIL brought barbarism to the City of Light. In a coordinated and cowardly act of terror, they slaughtered 132 innocent lives, wounded over 350 other people. And before that, they attacked peaceful shoppers in Beirut, demonstrators in Ankara, vacationers in the Sinai. Um, earlier this week, suicide bombers struck a market in Kano, killing at least 30 people. And as you know, today gunmen stormed a hotel in Bamako, taking over 170 hostages temporarily. At the same time, um, these, these grim reminders that after a decade uh, more, post 9-11, the global threat of terrorism has not receded. These actions are proof that terrorism has simply reconstituted and it remains a grave threat to all of us in every part of the globe. And as we grapple with this spate of violence and we steel ourselves for the struggle ahead, we must be careful to heed the lessons of the last decade plus. President Obama said the United States will never shy away from using force to protect our citizens and allies. Um, and we will be intensifying the campaign to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL with new strikes against their leaders, oil fields, and territory. We have to continue to capture and kill terrorists of all stripes, whether they are fighting in Syria's civil war, fomenting insurgency in Mali or Iraq, plotting in safe havens in Libya, or slaughtering innocents in Nigeria. But we do have to remember amidst our outrage, that no number of airstrikes, soldiers, or spies can eliminate the complex motives and the hateful ideologies that feed terrorism. And this is what I really want to talk about today, how the United States and a growing number of our partners around the world are mobilizing a broader approach to address the underlying forces that make people vulnerable to the lure of violent extremism. And we call this broader approach countering violent extremism, or CVE, in Washington parlance. How did the United States come to push a broader civilian-led preventive effort as an essential complement to our military and intelligence actions against terrorism? And the simple answer is learning. Learning from more than a decade since that searing experience of 9-11, lessons that are particularly relevant in this current moment of heightened international outrage following the most recent spate of attacks. So let me remind us the journey that we've traveled. After September 11, the US arrayed extraordinary military and intelligence tools to dismantle terror networks abroad. And our efforts successfully decimated core Al-Qaeda leadership and prevented a catastrophic attack on the homeland. Yet as we targeted, targeted Al-Qaeda, and eliminated key leaders, its remnants dispersed and adapted. Some terrorist groups aligned with aggrieved communities by merging with regional militias or insurgencies. Others entered areas of failed governance and began controlling territory, resources, and populations. Many exploited digital platforms to disseminate their twisted ideologies, recruit vulnerable individuals, and coordinate cells around the world. The rise of ISIL truly epitomizes the evolution and endurance of violent extremism over the last decade and the complex ways in which it can intertwine with other pre-existing national security challenges like civil conflict and failed states. ISIL's ability to both hold territory with ground forces while simultaneously conducting and inspiring global attacks against soft targets makes it a threat at multiple levels. And the continued spread and resurgence of ISIL's brand underscores that while traditional hard approaches remain vital, they are insufficient for addressing the conditions that make people vulnerable to joining these groups in the first place, whether it's an individual halfway around the world or an entire community that comes to see ISIL as a better bet than its own government. As President Obama has said, our military and intelligence efforts are not going to succeed alone. They have to be matched by political and economic progress to address the conditions that ISIL has exploited in order to take root. 
And that's the rationale for what our government calls CVE. While non-military means to address ideology or strengthen community resilience to violent extremism are not new, the Obama administration has developed them within a broader preventive and civilian-led framework, and it seeks to expand their role in how we address threats of terrorism at home, abroad, and in concert with our international partners. Early in the Obama administration, the United States began expanding our civilian tools to counter terrorist propaganda and build resilience in vulnerable communities. In 2010, we established the Center for Strategic Counterterrorist Communication, or the CSCC, to amplify our counter-messaging efforts across the interagency. A year later, the United States government began piloting development and other projects to build community resilience to violent extremism and to counter radicalization abroad. It helped establish institutions such as Hadaya, the first international center to support civilian-led approaches to counter violent extremism. And while all of these efforts fell under the moniker of CVE, they remained modest, uncoordinated, under-resourced, and lacking an overarching national and international framework. And that's begun to change over the past year as the Obama administration began broadening CVE in our practice at home and with partners abroad in three critical ways that I will outline in turn. The first is the emphasis on prevention. CVE calls for pushing back against the recruitment methods that terrorist groups use to target vulnerable individuals while providing these individuals with off-ramps from the path of radicalization. And in doing so, CVE seeks to tighten the flow of recruits to the current generation of terrorist groups and to better prevent new ones from emerging. CVE also recognizes the need to address the so-called push factors that make people vulnerable to these calls. This means helping governments and communities address the political, social, and economic grievances that terrorists exploit. These grievances vary enormously, which explains how ISIL has drawn recruits from nearly every region and walk of life, from conflict-ridden provinces in western Iraq to working-class neighborhoods in Brussels. Their sources exist at the individual or at the community level, and some of these sources of motivation will be beyond a government's capacity to address. But national governments have a key impact. A recent study showed that over the last 25 years, up to 92% of all terrorist attacks have occurred in countries where state-sponsored violence, like torture and extrajudicial killings, was widespread. By governing effectively and inclusively, upholding the rule of law, respecting human rights, and avoiding heavy-handed responses to terrorist and other security threats, governments can help reduce discontents that are exploited by violent extremist networks to mobilize recruits and support. But of course, grievances cannot alone fully explain, and they can never justify, the rise of violent extremism. Whatever fertile soil enables terrorist radicalization, it is the extremist ideology, extremist propaganda, extremist terror networks that channel people to violence. And a critical piece of CVE's preventative work is pushing back against the twisted beliefs and recruitment tactics that violent extremists wield to influence communities and target vulnerable individuals. We can identify these individuals when they begin their path to radicalization. Law enforcement and community level interventions can divert them from that path. But this requires constructive relationships between communities at risk and the local officials, relationships that are rooted in mutual respect and trust. When communities feel that they can turn to local officials without fear of persecution, they're more likely to, to report suspicious activity and to seek assistance for friends and family who are showing the signs of radicalization. Yet such trust and respect are often the key ingredients absent in places that are in the greatest need of such preventive work. As we've seen in the United States with all variety of lone wolf actions who kill fellow citizens in schools or make threats, we lack the strategies to assuredly prevent every individual from descending into violence. For radicalized individuals, imprisonment can be necessary to prevent violence. And at this stage, CVE means ensuring that the time spent behind bars helps individuals rehabilitate. 
And finally, when former members of violent extremist groups are released from jail or when current members become disillusioned and want out, CVE means finding secure and effective ways to reintegrate them into their communities. CVE encompasses all of these efforts in a preventive civilian-led framework that must be adapted to local context because the forces that can fuel violent extremism are remarkably complex, overlapping and oftentimes only apparent at the community level. Though national governments have a vital role in all of this work, effectively addressing these complex forces requires a much broader set of actors. Which brings me to the second core element of CVE, an emphasis on a whole of society approach. CVE calls for broadening the bench in the shared struggle against violent extremism to include local officials, businessmen, women, leaders of religious organizations, researchers, um, parents, youth, former members, and victims of violent extremist groups. Local leaders are much better positioned to cultivate the relationships and partnerships that we need in local communities. As President Obama said in Ankara earlier this week while discussing our strategy to defeat ISIL, if you do not have local populations that are committed to inclusive governance and who are pushing back against ideological extremes, they resurface. And what does a whole of society CVE effort look like? Essentially, it's reinforced trust and cooperation among government and people with local actors empowered to contribute to the shared struggle. Mainstream religious leaders are critical CV actors for several reasons. They can teach the tenets of faith to vulnerable youth who are searching for spiritual guidance. But mainstream religious voices feel too, that feel too vulnerable to speak out or who lack the tools to communicate widely they require assistance, and CVE efforts can help protect and empower them as messengers of tolerance. CVE, civil society, can help youth develop a sense of purpose through civic engagement. And women are often the first uh, to detect warning signs of radicalization, and they can play a key role in helping off-ramp children into alternative opportunities. Young people are some of the most persuasive voices against violent extremism among their peers, and few have greater credibility to debunk terrorist lies and propaganda than the former members and victims of violent extremist groups. So these are examples of the ways in which you can recruit different and complementary aspects of civil society to become part of this whole of society effort. The U.S. has shifted its CVE efforts at home and galvanized a global movement to reflect this whole of society approach. As the CSCC steps up efforts to push back against terrorist propaganda online, it now does more to empower credible voices outside government by connecting them with at-risk individuals and equipping them with effective counter messages. A recent campaign under the hashtag why they left Dash gave de defectors a platform to dissuade potential recruits by exposing the brutality of life under the so-called Islamic State. Actors outside of national government have also assumed greater roles in this shared struggle. Earlier this year, young leaders from every region gathered at the first ever Global Youth CVE Summit to showcase the innovative tools that they developed to counter the appeal of violent extremism among their peers. At home in the United States, in Boston, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles, we've seen local officials partner with educators, social service providers, academics, and community leaders to build resilience to violent extremism through holistic and tailored responses. Last September, mayors from around the world launched the Strong Cities Network to exchange good practices for building local resilience against violent extremism. Today, in Aarhus, Denmark, the network's wrapping up its first event to explore how best to develop city-level tools and partnerships for CVE. Local communities are truly on the front line of this struggle, and few cities appreciate this more so than Paris. So it's fitting that Paris will host the network's first annual summit next spring. The attacks in Mali, in Paris, before that in Beirut and Ankara, underscore the global reach of violent extremism. And the breadth of this threat suggests the importance of directing our CV efforts effectively, which brings me to the third aspect of CVE, which is the need to focus on the most vulnerable individuals and communities using evidence-based approaches. 
No government can fully eliminate discontents and grievances that terrorists exploit to recruit individuals or mobilize whole communities. Here in the United States, the case of individual lone wolves who have no prior affiliation with ISIL's nominal aims, let alone with Islam, are a growing concern that shows the difficulty, just as does that rash of school shootings I mentioned earlier, of prevention at an individual level. But where there's evidence that terrorist propaganda is luring recruits, we should prioritize our CVE efforts to help communities protect their children from the siren call of violent extremism. Identifying those vulnerabilities and the underlying factors requires rigorous analysis and research, which are also vital for measuring the impact of the CVE responses so that we can continue to learn what works most effectively and invest and adapt the most effective approaches. We still have much to learn, but we're making very important progress. On the international CVE front, for example, the Department of State recently established a new unit within the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations to analyze the underlying drivers of violent extremism in different global contexts to help us better diagnose the problems and direct our responses. This analysis feeds into a new state initiative to develop CVE programming through an integrated and holistic process across the department. Now states launching CVE pilot programs in Africa that are focused on the most at-risk communities and on the key drivers of radicalization using carefully tailored evidence-based approaches. We also look to actors outside government, like the Washington Institute, for contributions to this research and analysis. Just a few months ago, I attended the launch for Resolve, a new network for researchers, especially those at the local level, to share their findings and resources as they uncover community-level drivers of violent extremism and identify the most effective remedies to address them. I encourage all of you in this room, including the Institute, to support this network by contributing your own scholarship or by mentoring local researchers. In summary, these three tenets of CVE are preventing indiv more individuals and communities from aligning with violent extremist movements, partnering with a broader range of actors for a whole of society approach, and third, focusing on the most vulnerable communities. In doing so, CVE seeks to move U.S. counterterrorism toward a more proactive, affirmative, and preventive approach. This complements our hard security efforts because by containing the spread of terrorist threats, CVE uh, makes it more likely that our hard security approaches can succeed. It's not a question of either drone strikes in Libya, global campaign against ISIL, or CVE. The complex and generational threat of violent extremism demands both. Over the last two years, the Obama administration has dramatically elevated CVE in the international agenda and has focused the world on the need for more holistic civilian-led efforts to prevent the rise and spread of violent extremism. This effort kicked into high gear last February at the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, where representatives for the first time from foreign governments, multilateral bodies, civil society, business, and the faith community, for the first time came together <coughs> to talk about these broader dimensions of the struggle against violent extremism. And they outlined a concrete action agenda to put the CVE approach into action around the world. And when participants gathered again this past September on the margins of the UN General Assembly to review the progress that had been made, the global CVE movement had grown to more than 100 countries, 20 multilateral bodies, and 120 civil society groups <coughs> with much to report. Governments in every region had stepped up to engage new state and municipal governments, civil society, and the private sector around their CVE action agenda. Several countries had developed national CVE action plans with meaningful roles for non-governmental actors. The United Arab Emirates, Emirates established a regional messaging center to counter violence, violent extremist propaganda. In Nigeria, Malaysia, and the Organization for Islamic Cooperation have announced plans to do the same. Multilateral bodies like the World Bank and the United Nations have become increasingly engaged in CVE. And in the coming months, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will, re will release his plan of action to mobilize a whole of UN response to violent extremism. That plan will outline steps for all UN bodies and for member states 
to continue contributing to this shared struggle. While these developments are hopeful, they're positive, we're mindful of the enormous challenges ahead. It's no secret that many of our closest partners for counterterrorism may publicly welcome a more civilian-led approach, but in practice continue to rely on short-term and often heavy-handed responses that do little to address the underlying conditions that enable violent extremism to take root. The Obama administration will continue to press the case for CBE around the world, fully aware that changes in government behavior require tough and persistent engagement, and we are at the beginning of a new approach. Even as the President has committed the U.S. to military efforts, we will not shy away from explaining to our <coughs> international partners how respecting human rights, upholding the rule of law, and empowering civil society are inseparable from the larger struggle against violent extremism. In fact, our own in-house analyses show that violent extremist groups are up to four times more likely to emerge in states that do not respect human rights. During Secretary Kerry's recent trip to Central Asia, he echoed this point, warning that terrorism is not a legitimate excuse to lock up political opponents, diminish the rights of civil society, or pin false labels on activists who are engaged in peaceful <coughs> dissent. Practices of this type are not only unjust, but counterproductive. They play directly into the hands of terrorists. So too, warned President Obama, does xenophobic rejection of Syrian refugees, which is a rejection of our fundamental values and feeds directly into <coughs> terrorist narratives. The CDE effort becomes especially critical during this moment of heightened grief and anger. As the world demands justice for ISIL's most recent crimes and continued savagery become, can become easy and expeditious to rely exclusively on hard security actions in a quest for perceived immediate results. And similarly, it can be tempting to invoke counterterrorism as a pretext to disregard human rights and discount more complex long-term approaches. So as we intensify the global campaign against ISIL's territory finances and followers abroad, we can't lose sight of the fundamental truth <coughs> that no bomb, bullet, or wiretap can address the complex factors and hateful ideologies that feed violent extremism. We, the international community, will break violent extremism through not only our force of arms, but by upholding international values and empowering local communities. Thanks, and I look forward to the discussion.